Welcome everyone to CG seminar number 269. It's, going, it's mounting up, isn't it? And today we've got Charlie Eaton from the uh, University of California Merced to talk to us about the role of financiers in US higher education. Before I introduce Charlie in full, let me take you through the webinar protocols. Now remember that the webinar is being recorded and it'll be posted online on the CG website in a couple of days. Uh, we'll also post the chat function. That uh, CG webinar link is to a YouTube version of today's webinar and we're finding that people are using the YouTube version of the webinar even more than they're using the um, attendance at the live webinar as to date. Now, during the webinar, please keep yourself muted unless you've been asked to speak or you're asking a question in the Q&A. Um, there's no need to have your video on either during the webinar, but again, we'd like you to turn it on when you're coming into the discussion part of the webinar. We recommend using speaker view in the top right-hand corner there, so you can more clearly see who is talking. Now to ask a question, and we really strongly recommend that you do, um, Q&A is an important part of our webinars. Uh, to ask a question, use the chat function. Put your question or your statement into the chat and uh, I'll select um, the Q&A participants on the basis of what's coming in into the chat. The, the, the situation is that if you put forward your thoughts early and they're relevant to the webinar topic, uh, then you'll be selected into the Q&A. If you come in late, like in the last 10 minutes or so, there's a chance you'll miss out because we'll already have a full speaking list by that point. When you're uh, invited into the Q&A part, and I'll send you a, a warning uh, message through the chat, please unmute yourself and switch on your video and then state your name and where you are from. Well, let me present Charlie Eaton to you. As he's an assistant professor of sociology at Merced in California, where he co-founded the um, Higher Education, Race and the Economy Lab called H-E-R-E, -E, here. Nice acronym. His book, Bankers in the Ivory Tower, The Troubling Rise of Financiers in US Higher Education will be available this month. Um, and uh, uh, we can expect, I think, to hear a little bit about the contents of that book today in, in the webinar. Um, I think the word troubling is very useful. You know, it just it creates a bit of affect there, it sort of catches attention that, uh, that otherwise uh, a standard title doesn't do. So Charlie, we look forward to hearing what you have to say and, uh, and then to discussing it with you once you finish around about halfway through. Over to you. Great, thank you so much, Simon. I will have to pass along uh, pass along your uh, appreciation for the word troubling to my uh, editor Elizabeth Branch Dyson at University of Chicago Press. She was the uh, uh, the one who thought of the word troubling for the title. Um, and thank you for that that kind introduction. I'm very grateful to uh, to Simon and to Trevor and the center's team for having me. Um, I'm also thankful to Yanya from Lancaster University um, and the University and Unicorns Project for connecting us. Um, and uh, I'm very excited to learn from you all today. I imagine many of you will have insights uh, about America's bankers in the ivory tower from a more cross national and comparative perspective. Um, I'm gonna share some slides uh, so I'm going to throw those up right now. Um, and uh, so the slides should now be vi uh, visible. Um, yep, we can see and So for those of you who have questions or thoughts that we don't get to today, I hope that you'll share them afterwards. You can find me here on Twitter um, and you can also find my email with a quick Google. Um, and for those of you who are interested in the data that I'm sharing today, please stay tuned for the new Higher Education Data Hub website that's gonna launch next week. Um, the Data Hub is an initiative of our Higher Education Race in the Economy Lab at UC Merced, um, the University of California Merced. 
And if you're struck by the lab's logos or any of my graphs today, it may be because they draw on data visualization styles developed by the sociologist W.E.B. Du Bois at the beginning of the 20th century. And the Data Hub will provide most of the data and all of the code for what I'm gonna to present today, including code for rendering graphs in these Du Boisian styles that you see in these logos and that you'll see in the graphs I present. Um, I'm gonna to focus today on my book's approach to explaining two new American inequalities that I argue are connected. The first new inequality is a resurgence in financier wealth at the top. I illustrate this financier resurgence here with a figure from one of my working papers with Albina Gibadulina. We use the Forbes 400 list to plot the percent of the 400 wealthiest Americans by selected sectors in 1989, 2003, and 2017. The brown bar for each year shows that the share of America's wealthiest billionaires from finance increased from 12% in 1989 to 25% in 2017, with most of this growth occurring by 2003. The green bar shows that private equity and hedge fund managers account for almost all of this relative growth in financier billionaires. Private equity and hedge fund managers made up 16% of the Forbes 400 in 2017, up from just 5% in 1989. And the yellow bar shows that other types of financiers made up just 9% of the Forbes 400 in 2017, not much different from their 7% share in 1989. So that's the first inequality. Now, the second inequality is the rise of highly unequal student debts in the US. Some of you might know that just one in eight undergraduates in the US had any student debt at all in the 1970s. Some of you might also know today that a majority of American college students leave school with the financial burden of an educational debt. You might also know that there are large class and racial inequalities in who borrows and who can afford to repay those debts. What I show in the book that's new is that student loan borrowing is highly unequal across different organizational strata of colleges. And financiers play a major role in these inequalities. I focus on the divergence of three higher education strata of student debt. At the top are elite private institutions where the fewest students borrow. In the middle are public universities that enroll 65% of all bachelor's degree seekers in the US, a majority of whom borrow. At the bottom are for-profit colleges whose, student, whose students are overwhelmingly working class and disproportionately black and whose students have the most debt. We can see the divergence of these three strata by plotting the percent of first year students with zero educational borrowing from 2000 to present. These are the only years for which there are comprehensive school level data. Private institutions are plotted with diamonds and the blue diamonds break out the Ivy League big three of Harvard, Princeton, and Yale, plus Stanford, all of which have adopted loan-free financial aid. As a result, we can see that today, more than 90% of students are debt-free at these schools. The red diamonds plot the other top 30 private universities in the Times Higher Education Rankings. At those schools, the percent of students who are debt-free increased from under 50% in 2000 to almost 70% in 2020. Public universities are plotted here with circles. Top 30 public universities are plotted with pink circles, showing that they have recently increased loan-free financial aid 
to close the gap with the top 30 private schools. I'll say a little bit more later about how this is encouraging because US public universities are very different from the top privates in their size and their economic diversity. The yellow circles show that less than 40% of students at lower ranked public universities are debt free. And the brown diamonds show that only 20% of students at for-profit colleges attend without borrowing. So how did this divergence occur? My answer is that financiers played a big role in each of these strata. Both in the broader financier resurgence and in the case of student debt, policy change was a prerequisite for the new inequalities. I think I jumped ahead a slide here. Um, the policy changes in the case of higher education were principally tax cuts and financial deregulation. Though I think regulation for the rich might be a better term for important regulatory changes in both higher education finance and in finance generally. Tax cuts and new regulations for the rich allowed financiers to play varied roles across the three higher education strata. At the top, financiers restored elite private universities as the last bastion of debt-free higher education. They did this by partnering with their endowments to exploit tax cuts and financial deregulation. These schools hoarded this endowment boom for their small, mostly privileged, and now debt-free student bodies. At the bottom, financiers took over for-profit colleges and mass to capture public subsidies around federal student loan expansion in the US. Now in the middle, public universities were squeezed by these tax and subsidy diversions to the top and bottom strata. Though we've already seen some encouraging signs for how Berkeley, or excuse me, for how public universities have navigated this squeeze. Now, what exactly were the policies that I would call regulation for the rich? Uh, in the case of higher education, a critical and mostly overlooked policy shift was the 1992 Higher Education Act reauthorization and a few legislative tweaks to that bill in 1993 and 1994. This new regulation for the rich did four things that made possible the new student debt inequalities. First, the act eliminated means tests for federal student loans. Before this, only lower income students could borrow using the main federal loan program. Second, the act doubled the cap on how much a student could borrow by the end of their undergraduate studies from 30,000 to over 70,000 in 2015 constant dollars. Third, the act eliminated the borrowing cap for parent loans. And finally, and this was crucial, the act gave a guarantee subsidy to private lenders to make about half of all federal student loans. Under this guarantee, the treasury would pay private lenders what they were owed if any borrower failed to repay. This regulation effectively guaranteed a profit for private lenders and cost about $6 billion more annually than it would have cost for the treasury to just make the loans directly to students. So why did Congress, including Democrats, adopt these policy changes? To quote the title of sociologist Neil Fligstein's new book, the short answer is the banks did it. The key parts of this act were taken directly from a proposal submitted in congressional hearings by the National Council of Higher Education Loan Programs, whose graduation cap logo is in the upper right here. The Loan Program Council had overlapping membership with the Consumer Bankers Association, who were also major players in the lobbying for the bill. Sally May and the predecessors to the big four consumer banking um, 
uh, banks with logos here were all among the biggest lenders to exploit these new subsidies. Consistent with the tax cut story, colleges ultimately supported the new plan as well, but they only did so because tax cuts had reduced per student funding for their preferred funding source of Pell Grants for more than a decade. But was this policy shift really what led to the explosion of student debt? In a word, yes. We can see that here. The green line plots federal student loan borrowing in 2015 constant dollars. The blue line plots federal student loan borrowing per full-time equivalent student enrolled in eligible institutions. This shows that borrowing was flat from the end of the 1970s until 1992 at around $20 billion annually. After the 1992 reform, borrowing then quintupled to almost $120 billion annually at its peak in 2010. But as we saw earlier, borrowing has actually decreased since 2000 to negligible levels at the most elite private institutions. The growth in borrowing since 2000 was principally at for-profit colleges and less resourced public institutions. So let's unpack the role of financiers in these divergences. First, at the top, it's important to note that elite privates have hoarded their endowments for relatively few socioeconomically advantaged undergrads. As economist Raj Chetty has recently shown, 38 top private universities in the US actually enroll more students from the top 1% of the income distribution than from the bottom 60% combined. How did elite private schools get such large endowments in the first place though is an important question to ask. Here, the Ivy League social ties of private equity and hedge funds are a big part of the story. Again, tax cuts and new regulations for the rich were important. These policy changes allowed private equity and hedge funds to net much bigger after-tax investment returns. But few have appreciated that elite private universities were the earliest major investors in these new, risky, and untested funds. Private equity and hedge fund managers also may use private information from their university social ties to find the most lucrative investments and to raise capital. One very prominent and public example involves two Yale alumni. Hedge fund billionaire, billionaire Tom Steyer, pictured on the left, and the late Yale endowment manager David Swenson. Steyer has said that he learned from a friend at the Yale homecoming football game in the mid 1980s that Swenson was starting to make internal hedge fund investments for the Yale endowment. Steyer then got a meeting with Swenson to ask him to invest in his hedge fund. The New York Times reported on this in a story titled, For Yale's Money Man, A Higher Calling. The story reads, and I quote, David told us, I don't see why we would give you any money. You might shut down after a bad year, Mr. Steyer recalled. It was only after Mr. Steyer swore that he wouldn't shut down and that he wouldn't immediately charge Mr. Swenson 20% of his profits and other fees that Mr. Swenson gave Mr. Steyer $300 million of Yale's money, end quote. The role of such collegiate social ties persist in investment relationships between endowments and, in, and investment managers. One striking indicator of this is that Brown, Columbia, Cornell, Dartmouth, Harvard, Penn, Princeton, and Yale all disclosed in 2013 that they had investments involving at least one member of their university board of trustees, all alumni. 
But did these ties really matter for making some of the earliest and most lucrative investments in private equity and hedge funds? This is one place where I was able to make an informative cross-national comparison in the book. I asked a top financial administrator at an elite university outside of the US how their investments compared to those of the Ivies. That administrator is pictured here with a silhouette to protect their identity. I hope you aren't able to recognize them from their suit and tie, but they told me in an email, quote, we did not have the contacts with Wall Street hedgies. We did not have the scale to become, uh, to be welcome as Wall Street hedgy customers. So that's the top. The social ties and the scale of elite schools endowments were key. Now, what about the bottom? At the bottom, private equity managers, including the same managers with capital from endowments, acquired 994 for-profit colleges in the US between 1988 and 2015. They did so to capture tuition revenue from expanded loan programs. It is hard to overstate how important this private equity invasion was in the explosion of enrollment at for-profit predatory colleges in the US, colleges that overwhelmingly left students with crushing debts and no economic benefits. This ch chart here illustrates the centrality of private equity by plotting for-profit college enrollments over time by colleges type of financial ownership. In Brown, we see that enrollments have been relatively flat at around 500,000 students in colleges with what is called privately held ownership. Privately held ownership includes family ownership and typically involves ownership by someone who has worked in the field the school focuses on, like a beautician, a graphic designer, or a medical technologist. These schools have no ownership by outside investors. These are also the schools that private equity started buying up by the dozens in the late 1990s. Now, green shows enrollment at schools that were owned by a private equity firm in a given year. We see that these enrollments start to grow in the late 1990s and reach a peak of around 500,000 in 2010. Just as important, yellow is enrollment at schools that were bought by a private equity firm, but then were taken public in an initial public offering to sell their stock on the stock market. These schools had total enrollments of over 600,000 at their peak in 2010. Red is enrollment at companies that are publicly traded without any prior ownership by private equity, a little under half of that enrollment is from just one company, the parent company of the University of Phoenix. So in sum, private equity investors oversaw much of the growth in the for-profit colleges that sucked up federal student loans and their subsidies. Now, what about the role of financiers in the middle? The impact of financiers in the middle came mostly from the ways that they captured tax cuts and subsidies at the top and the bottom. This resource capture diverted resources away from public universities. I summarize here some of the largest and most identifiable diversions of tax resources away from public universities in the US. These diversions can be, and to some extent already have been, redirected back to public universities since their peak 10 years ago. First, endowments enjoy roughly a $20 billion federal tax expenditure annually via tax exemptions, despite their explicit management to maximize investment returns. Beyond this, hedge funds and private equity funds pass along to endowment investors a share of their earnings that increase when they re uh, return greater earnings from tax expenditures such as capital gains tax cuts and carried interest loopholes, tax expenditures that number in the hundreds of billions annually in the US. Second, for-profit colleges captured $10 billion annually at their peak 
from uh, just from federal subsidies for enrolling low income students in Pell Grants, the low income uh, student grant program. And third, and perhaps the largest redirection of subsidies back to public universities is a $6 billion annual increase in Pell Grant funding that the Obama administration budget, budget, budgeted uh, by eliminating the guarantee subsidy to private loan lenders in 2010. Now, how might we go beyond these important but partial steps in a less troubling direction? I think that a better future is possible if we mobilize a more diverse and inclusive public university to reimagine finance from below. I place higher education in parentheses here because more equitable higher education finance is probably only possible as part of a more equitable overall financial system. But public universities can play a central role in advancing such change by connecting people from more varied backgrounds than the ivory tower bankers who got us here. In fact, public universities are already doing this in many ways. One example is that Occupy Wall Street protests at public universities gave a critical boost to a successful push to increase taxes on millionaires and freeze tuition in California in 2012. The tax increase and tuition freeze were ultimately negotiated by a range of University of California leaders and alumni like the UC Student Association President Claudia Magana, California Federation of Teachers President Josh Pestalt, Governor Jerry Brown, and California State Assembly Speaker John Perez. Another example is the role of two University of California economics professors who designed a wealth tax advanced by Senator Elizabeth Warren, herself a product of America's academic and public interest law networks. These economists also represent the potential of public universities to link global exchanges of ideas to local and national projects for financial equity. The two Berkeley economists, Gabriel Zuckman and Emmanuel Saez, are also known for popularizing strategies for global wealth taxes with their collaborator and fellow French national, Thomas Piketty. These ideas contributed to the recent global agreement for a corporate minimum tax and its very real chance of passage in the US. Zuckman and Saez's work is also advancing other countermeasures against international tax shelters that are routinely exploited by financiers, including by university endowments. I expect that such efforts will be crucial to redistributing fiscal resources more equitably in higher education, not just in America, but internationally. But I have a lot more to learn about the state of play in higher education and finance beyond the US. And that's what makes me so honored and excited to be in conversation with you all here today. Thank you so much. And uh, back to you, Simon. Thanks, Charlie, for the masterly clarity with which you set out the problem. Um, and I'm gonna um, stop the screen share, by the way, because I yeah, do that. find that distracting. Yeah, good. Uh, that was just great, and uh, you know, it's such such good slides, such good explanation. I've got a couple of questions, and um, we uh, greatly, uh, I think, welcome uh, our our watchers and listeners to come in into the chat now and suggest further questions and statements they'd like to make. I see Rob Cuthbert's already there. Bring Rob in in a minute. Let me ask you, Charlie. Back to 1992, 93. I mean, this is uh, you know opening Pandora's box. Uh, this was going to happen, wasn't it, when those decisions were made? What kind of debate was there at that point? Uh, and, uh, you know, was there, uh, was there an awareness of what was at stake? Um, and, uh, and what's happening under Biden? I mean, how is, how is the Biden presidency addressing this, this, this framework of financing with its top and bottom and middle? Uh, what's it want to do about it? Great. Two great questions. Um, and I'm just going to make a note to come back to the Biden part. First, um, 
the book goes a lot deeper into how the decision gets made um, in 1992. And one of the ways I get deeper is I compare the debate in 1992 with the debate in 1979, because this Higher Education Act is something that gets, it's supposed to be reauthorized in the US um, every half decade or so. And if you look at 1979, the, the trade associations, for the colleges and universities are very skeptical in 1979 of student loans. And if you read their comments, they're actually quite prescient. They say, we worry that if we increase student loans, it'll provide this alternative resource that will undercut direct fiscal appropriations uh, from government to universities, and that will undercut our preferred funding program of Pell Grants that don't have these risks for students. And if you then go forward to 1992, there is a, um, you know, you look at some quotes, there are a lot of promises made uh, that the chapter of the book is titled Bankers to the Rescue, because basically people have failed to adequately increase Pell Grant funding and other university funding throughout the 80s to keep up with enrollment growth and to keep up with more low income students starting to attend college. Um, and so the bankers, I say they kind of sweep in to come to the rescue. And you have a number of Democrats, including President Bill Clinton, who uh, who treat the, you know, the bankers and the promises they're making as a sort of fairy tale that they've, they've bought into. Um, that they say is gonna provide opportunity for all, but they really have blinders on about the risks. And it's really the, the bankers who are saying, look, we can run the system well, we've got this program where we can uh, finance these loans and you can't get the resources anywhere else. So you should do it from the loan program. And if you give us these subsidies, we'll run the program better than the government can run it itself. That's kind of the debate. Um, and the colleges, uh, particularly private colleges, um, they get on board um, in that year and they back the bank's program. I talked to a woman named Jane Wellman, who was the um, executive director uh, for the um, uh, National Association of Independent Colleges and Universities, NICU, which represents private schools. And she said when she was hired just before that bill by NICU, their board of directors told her that her one job was to get money from the bill, and that's a quote, and they didn't care where the money came from, and the loan program was the only place where the money was going to come from. So that kind of gives you a sense of the, the different actors involved. Now, the Biden administration, um, you know, a fascinating thing is that I would say people who are deeply concerned about student debt and who support both uh, expanded federal funding for debt-free higher education and student debt cancellation. Those folks uh, have essentially been appointed by the Biden administration to run the US Department of Education and the very important Consumer Finance Protection Bureau, which is a new large important federal agency that, that regulates student loans that was in fact created in part by um, a push by Elizabeth Warren and some of these academic law networks that I, that I talked about. Um, so there is a lot of expertise and support in the, um, the Biden administration for doing some things. The Biden administration has canceled about $10 billion in student, student debt, and they included a substantial increase in federal funding for free higher education in their large social spending bill, but it, that social spending bill after looking like it was gonna pass, basically failed by one vote um, in December. And so where that leaves the state of play is that we may get some new revenue um, this year, such as via the um, corporate minimum tax that I, um, that I mentioned earlier, but it also means that less can be done by legislation because our Senate is deadlocked 50-50 and more can be done by executive order. And so there's this debate about how much to do and what to do by executive action. Um, and 
quite a bit can actually be done as is reflected by the $10 billion that the Biden administration has canceled. Also prominently folks might know, student loan interest accrual and repayment has been paused for over two years or for almost two years in the US now. And that is effectively a cancellation of about $100 billion in student debt annually, because that's about how much interest would be accruing if we were allowing interest to accrue on this on student debt. Um, and there's a lot of reservation in the Biden administration about restarting payments, because we think we would thrust a whole bunch of folks into default on student loans who've gotten used to no payments. Um, and that nobody wants to do that in an election year. And so that is creating a political context where we might have some sort of reset in our student loan system by doing some sort of large scale cancellation by executive order. But that is still very much in play and in flux, which is part of what makes this an exciting moment for higher education finance. But the window will be closing soon. <laughs> yeah, it always does. Yeah, that's right. You've got to seize your opportunity while it's there. It's timing is everything, isn't it? Okay, Rob, come in. Um, your question is very interesting. Rob Cuthbert. Uh, right, thank you. Charlie, it was just a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm just, uh, I'm not too well informed, but I know that um, the Obama administration did a lot in terms of trying to roll back the worst excesses of the for profits and, and so on with the gainful employment regulations. And, and then Trump, I think, reversed some of those at least. And, and I'm just wondering what part they played and how significant they were in, in what you've been talking about. Yeah, great, great question. And the book does get into that. Um, you know, the, the, the Obama administration, I also did mention, they reversed this 1992 subsidy to private banks to do, the, to do about half of all federal student lending. Um, so we no longer have private banks doing our federal student lending because of this change in 2010 by the Obama administration. Um, that saved $6 billion that we now spend instead on Pell Grants <clears throat> annually. And that basically got banks out of the politics of federal student loan policy. And so I think that <clears throat> is sort of underappreciated as a major uh, strategic um, uh, change for, uh, for student loan politics. Um, it's one of the things that's opened the door to doing more of these debt relief initiatives um, and for trying to make our student loan system more equitable. The Obama administration, as you said, also did these things to say, okay, if you are a for-profit college and you get student loans, you have to, uh, your students have to be above a certain threshold in their ability to repay their student loans. Um, and their incomes have to be above a certain average income uh, relative to their, their average student loan burden. And if you don't, you're going to lose your subsidies. And in fact, uh, some of the largest uh, Wall Street owned for profit college firms collapsed because once they had to live up to these consumer protection standards, they we're no longer profitable. Um, and so you've actually seen quite a precipitous decline in for-profit enrollments from their, their peak where their, their enrollments were above two and a half million students annually. They're, I think they've been back around one and a half million annually for quite a while. Um, and uh, about 100,000 students who had student debts from enrollment there have had their debts canceled. The, the Trump administration was not terribly effective at just about anything. Um, their one triumph was passing a tax cut, which quite ironically, that tax cut included a restoration of a small tax on endowments, which had been um, completely tax exempt since 1984. It of course used that tax cut for endowments to, uh, to budget tax, uh, 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 <laughs> they used the tax hike on endowments to budget tax cuts for other very wealthy people. Um, but uh, the Trump administration was not very effective in moving a regulatory or legislative agenda. And so a lot of the um, gainful employment and other for-profit regulations that, that Trump tried to roll back, they weren't able to really fully 
push the rollback through all of the litigation that the consumer protection advocates brought against it. So a lot of the regulatory framework held up. And I would say that mostly I, I expect a pretty offensive um, uh, regulatory agenda by the Department of Education in the next two and a half years. They've got a tremendous amount of expertise there. They've learned a lot of lessons um, from their regulations of for-profit colleges and student loan servicers and others. And, um, and I think they're going to interpret their regulatory authority pretty broadly to push even more aggressive um, consumer protection regulation. So I think that's going to be an interesting and exciting space to watch, especially after our midterm election when the Republicans will probably take Congress, which means that window of opportunity on anything legislative closes and the sort of theater of, um, of policymaking will shift entirely to the executive branch. Thanks, Charlie, and your optimism is, is, is encouraging and, uh, you know, all things are possible. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, we, and, and, you know, and we shouldn't look always to, to immiseration as our future. Um, yeah, concrete action can make a difference, executive action as well as uh, the legislature. Um, okay, can we bring in Claire Callender now? Uh, Claire's been making a couple of points in the chat. Hi, Charlie. Um, thanks for a fascinating um, presentation. Uh, I mean, just as a point of interest, and it's something that needs far greater in investigation, um, but um, private equity companies um, have been also important in terms of understanding the emergence of the private sector um, in, 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 in England in particular, um, although it's not a particularly thriving sector. And to some extent, there were lessons learned from the US, but, but maybe not enough. Um, and uh, they haven't been able to get a grasp on the sector in the way in which um, the government had wanted. But I suppose I have a couple of other questions. And that is, what more could be done to protect the most vulnerable, be they, um, uh, be they at um, the for-profits or um, other sectors of the higher education system. So what regulations could be put in force um, to, to protect them? And to what extent do you think that income contingent or um, uh, 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 loan repayments could help in terms of dealing with the burden of debt. But my understanding is, is uh, because as, as you well know, we have an income contingent system here, but it's very, very different from those income contingent loans available in the US and ours by comparison is a much simpler um, system. But what, what appetite do you think there is for change, again, to help with the burden of, of, of debt? Great questions. Um, uh, I'm really fascinated by what you said about uh, private equities uh, involvement in uh, in the UK. At, you know, one thing I've noticed, just to touch on that, um, in you know, I, I have a large database, and th this kind of data we we publish at uh, our higher ed data hub that's going to launch next week. Um, but one of the things we notice in the higher ed or in the private equity databases that we extract data from is that there was a substantial pivot to private equity deals involving education and higher education outside of the US after the consumer protection um, uh, crackdown. So it's, it's sort of similar kind of race to the bottom. If you're gonna be regulated here, go look for somewhere else where you're not going to be regulated. Um, but it's good to hear that, uh, that they, they haven't attained the same uh, hold where you are regarding what regulations can be made for the vulnerable. I think that two of the kind of most important things are we need to expand our, uh, our, our enrollment capacity and our resources at our, um, our higher quality institutions. So pub our public institutions are the institutions that have been willing to enroll uh, students in mass. Um, I think we need to either our private institutions that have these big endowments, the, the problem is that they hoard these endowments. So they enroll very similar numbers of students to 
what they enrolled in the 1970s, but their endowment is 10 times larger um, to, to the point where Princeton University, for example, which is a good example because they've got no business school, no medical school, no law school. So they're not doing any of that supposedly very high cost um, instruction. They spend about $100,000 per student that they enroll annually from the endowment um, on educational expenditures. So there's this huge subsidy for these schools with very, very small, uh, small uh, enrollments. I would like to see those schools double their enrollments. They could do a lot more. Um, it would make them, it would give them some space to be more economically diverse and racially diverse and it would relieve some pressure on other institutions. If they're not prepared to do that, we should tax those endowments and allocate those resources to public institutions that have been willing to enroll more students, either by creating new public universities um, in uh, regions that need it, or by expanding enrollments at existing public universities with adequate funding. That would relieve a lot of the pressure because basically what happens is, Students don't go to a for-profit college because it's a good school or a good opportunity. They go because they don't know of another better opportunity. Um, some of that is because of deceptive marketing by for-profit colleges. And I've got a very fancy mathematical paper to show that, but um, you don't really need the math to know that some of that's deceptive marketing. But a lot of it also is you, you can actually see this and also mathematically model this. If you cut funding for community colleges um, or other public institutions, enrollments then shift to the for-profit institutions. So we need to provide higher quality alternatives that don't have an incentive to rip students off. Um, to the extent that you want some for-profit institutions that can maybe pivot a little bit more to um, shifting market demands for um, uh, for education, students need to not bear the risk. Um, the risk needs to be borne by the government um, and by society and by the for-profit colleges themselves. Um, so that means no student should be going to a for-profit college with a sizable student loan because you're assuming too much risk that attending that college is not going to pan out for you. Um, those are a couple thoughts about regulations. I think we're going to get a lot of stuff to that effect from the Department of Education and in the next couple of years, and there will be some tests, um, some tests of what works. And we'll learn some things that work and we'll learn some things that don't work. And then unfortunately, the for-profit college sector will learn to get around what works. And well, we'll start, a, we'll start again. Um, regarding income contingent loans, yeah, I wish I, uh, I want to learn more about simpler income contingent loans um, or income-based loan repayment in other countries. I'm very skeptical of the of its ability to be successful in the US. Um, and also I'm particularly skeptical of it as a solution for existing borrowers. We have such large classes of borrowers who have these huge um, balances that they're never able to get rid of. And we've been trying for 30 years to provide relief via income contingent loan programs. And the number of students who have received the some sort of income-based um, relief where their debt is canceled ultimately because they just can't repay it is literally 10,000 students. And we have at any given time more than four, 40 million borrowers. Um, so I'm, I'm doubtful that in the US context that can work particularly via executive action. Um, I think we need more of a reset and then um, and then a, and then perhaps a simpler um, a simpler system that needs some fundamental changes, in, including some of these changes about the impossibility of bankruptcy discharge and um, 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 and some other, you know, other other problems. It, the the racial inequality in student debt is sort of front and center here because the kind of latest data shows that even after 20 years, the average black student loan borrower in the US still owes uh, around as much as they originally borrowed because of compound interest. So they make payments, but they still owe a substantial amount. And even if they've tried to enroll in income-based repayment that should cancel their debts after about 20 years, 
they we have very few cases of people actually getting it. Um, and it seems that the Department of Education is administratively unable to do this. Um, so I think that's part of why we need a, a reset and a and a broad a broad cancellation. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd love to have a, another conversation, but I want to leave. Yeah, email me or tweet at me. We'll find a time. Um, it's it's uh, all complicated. Thanks, Claire, and thanks, Charlie. Uh, Christina, Christina de Cavallo from Brazil, uh, who, who studies pr the private sector in Brazil. Your question, please. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Good morning from Brazil, Charlie. Uh, congratulations on an excellent presentation. I'm Christina Carvalho. I'm a professor at the University of Brasilia in Brazil. My research is focused on the financialization in higher education in Brazilian for-profit institutions. So I'd like to ask you about the strategies of US for-profit institutions towards the dissemination of this financialization model, like private equities and publicly held companies in middle-income countries in Latin America, especially in Brazil. Uh, even though after the deregulation in Obama administration. Uh, so thank you so much for your presentation is really important for me. In your Great. Research. Yeah, please be in touch. Um, I've definitely noticed uh, in the private equity deal space, some private equity investors taking interest in the Brazilian higher ed sector. You know, kind of my theory, my broader theory about what private equity has done in higher education is that the private equity business model was originally about extracting uh, profits through uh, financial engineering and through basically expropriating part of labor's share of income from companies through through leveraged buyouts in the 1980s and 1990s. But you can only expropriate labor's share of income from companies once. You can't keep doing it over and over. And so you actually, if you look at the type of investments that private equity does, um, they've been doing much more investment in government subsidized sectors for the last two decades and well beyond just US higher education. Um, and so I think as they as they exhaust one place to extract uh, public subsidy or monopoly rents in the US, if that door closes, then they look around for others. Um, and so the Brazilian context might be one um, where they're doing some of that. Thank you. Thanks so much. And can we bring in um, Mark Newman, who's been putting forward some interesting propositions in the chat. Mark, are you there? Hello, Mark. There he is. Far away. Hi. Um, yeah, sorry, I am uh, I work at UCL, uh, and uh, I'm, not, I'm not an expert in uh, higher education funding or fi uh, financial management uh, sector at all. I just happened to be an employee in a university. Yeah. Um, I was just pointing out in response to, I think it was Claire's uh, observation about the, the uh, although we don't have the same sort of diversity of uh, uh, financial models in higher education, like we don't have the same number of private universities uh, as as in the United States, so that we haven't seen exactly the same sort of situation you described. I think we have seen uh, a growth in the kind of financialization or uh, a marketization of higher education indirectly through the way in which universities have expanded their private borrowing for capital development in particular, uh, and their involvement in property uh, uh, development and property management mm -hmm. uh, around the sites that they own in particular in, in kind of city center sites. Um, and that, how that is linked to, to, to the kind yeah. of issues around student charges for students, student debts and, and university uh, and as uh, all those other issues that you raised. Yeah, I the sixth chapter of the book deals with increased um, bond borrowing by universities. And I have an observation about uh, um, people making these decisions to really radically increase their bond borrowing for capital investments, like, like capital projects, like um, buildings, uh, etc. 
which I observed this in the US, but I think it probably applies to um, institutions in the UK also. A lot of public institutions that don't have very big endowments saw that um, the big privates with very large endowments, they really, really increased their bond borrowing. And a lot of folks said, oh, that's cool. We can borrow more from bond markets for capital investments without, uh, without any assurance of some revenue sources, because that's what these privates are doing. So, And they're the elites, so we should copy them because they're doing it. But most, if you don't have a very, very large endowment, it's actually a much riskier proposition to do that. Because in a lot of cases, when the very well endowed schools borrow, part of what they're doing is an arbitrage where they can borrow using tax exempt um, bond borrowing um, in place of spending money that they would otherwise spend from the endowment. And so if you borrow from the bond market, and you only have to pay 2% interest. And that means you can keep some of your endowment assets and in, invested in the endowment at a 10% average annual rate of return. That's a, that's a kind of a no brainer. But if you don't have an endowment, um, you know, doing big borrowing for bond projects or, or for building projects is a much riskier proposition because there's much less assurance that whatever you're going to build is going to produce some sort of market-based revenue increase for you in the future to manage the debt service costs. So I'm, I tend to be a bit cautious on bond borrowing. Um, but thanks for that, that comment. Good, good to hear about what people are facing there. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Thanks for coming in. Um, and uh, Charlie, we've got a question from Wilson Nung in the chat. Wilson, do you want to come on? Hello. Uh, sorry, thank you, Simon. I'm trying to unmute myself and uh, unvideo myself. I know we have very short time left. Uh, I uh, have penned a, a course, an article on UKHE and private equity. I worked for private equity myself for, for over two decades. So I know the picture there. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the different guys, you know, 1890s. They call themselves, they, they mutate, you know, with different names and the latest uh, post-1990s is private equity. I'm interested in how UK uh, private equity, uh, uh, they've got into um, UK education. There's a question prior to mine, you know, uh, or an observation with a web link uh, about how um, a private UK private equity or international private equity institutions have got into uh, the funding of um, uh, UK higher education without actually running the institutions. You know, I mean, who provides the money actually, you know, um, obviously uh, has a big say in running an institution. I'm interested from a student perspective, how students can intervene, um, simply find information, uh, intervene um, if possible, where possible, uh, in uh, loan negotiation between PEs uh, and, um, uh, and, and, uh, and HEIs. Um, you, you know, I mean, drawing from the U.S. experience, perhaps, you know, uh, what what mechanisms might there be, you know, in the U.S., et cetera, you know, for for students to to mitigate their risk, which, which you were talking about, uh, Charlie? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, one of your comments reminded me one of the ways that private equity is trying to get in the back door to the higher education sector in the US in new ways, and I think in other nations, is through online degree programs, which often running or starting an online degree program involves subcontracting huge amounts of running the program, um, including often recruitment for the program to for-profit subcontractors. So my, my colleagues, and those folks are often um, private equity backed um, firms. So that's, that's a place where if you're a student, um, you can get involved in saying, okay, if we're going to have an online degree program, uh, maybe we should run it ourselves. Maybe uh, we should have be enrolling students who are similar to those who come to the, the brick and mortar campus. And maybe we shouldn't subcontract parts like, um, like recruitment. Um, I think also, I mean, really fundamentally, I think, uh, it does, there's just too much of a power asymmetry yeah. between mm -hmm. students as consumers and private equity investors and for-profit college firms um, as organizations for 
the students to discern what's quality, what is a fair loan terms, how do we negotiate? I think those kind of terms need to be set by through government regulation and via um, government intervention. So if I were a student and I was looking to shape this uh, and have a say, I would be seeking a voice in, um, in government regulatory agencies. And also I would be seeking resources from the regulatory agencies to do uh, research and um, information gathering to, to inform um, engagement by stakeholders like students in the regulatory process. You know, Charlie, just as a kind of a footnote to that, I mean, Simon knows, Simon Markson knows in the UK what problems uh, higher education and more generally government has, UK government has currently, you know, to be involved in relatively small oh, <laughs> number um, issues such as this. You know, that, that's the problem at the moment, you know, that all this is kind of below the radar because numbers are still, you know, relatively small. Yeah. Charlie, we're, we're kind of at the end of the webinar, I think, but um, uh, I want to thank you um, very sincerely. I think that was one of the best webinars we've ever had in terms of uh, the importance of the content and the quality of the presentation. It was real, it, it'll, it'll be repeatedly viewed on YouTube. And I think the, the, the one lesson we must draw from what Charlie has said is that we must read his book, Bankers in the Ivory Tower, published by University of Chicago Press. Look out for this book. Uh, I hope that I hope the press is selling it at a reasonable price. Uh, you know, too many academic books are far too expensive. If this is in paperback and being sold at an accessible price, it'll be great because it's a kind of book that must be widely read. Um, I think that, you know, uh, let me give you a if you yeah. buy from the University of Chicago website, um, which maybe somebody can get that into the chat, uh, there's a discount code of if you use the code Eaton, E A T O N 20, you get 20% off um, the book. And it's currently only on hard cap, uh, hard back, but it's priced at $27 in the US, which is pretty good for yeah. a hardback initial release. Um, and I think the Kindle version is a little cheaper. That is a good price for a hardback. Um, books are a bit cheaper in the US than they are in the UK, but that is a good price. And, and uh, Eaton, Eaton 20 will get you a further 20% off that. Yeah. And maybe it'll come down in paperback, um, especially if it sells well. Uh, that's very encouraging. Um, I noticed that uh, Rob Cuthbert has mentioned uh, Janja Komaljanovic's work in SRHE, and uh, that's a very useful tip. We should follow that one up. Um, yeah, and I'm on her advisory board, and so I get to follow that project, and I'm learning so much. So I'm a big fan of that University and Unicorns uh, project. Yeah, it's great work. Um, I think last comment I have is that, um, I mean, I think what you do is you explain so clearly what is happening, and uh, people don't ha have that from other sources, and so what you're doing is very important. Um, I think of what Piketty did with, you know, with... Uh, uh, capital in the 21st century in 2014. I mean, he just opened up that whole area of in income inequality in a really effective way, got tremendous coverage in the mainstream, uh, lots of attention. Uh, and, and, you know, we know a lot about inequality as a result of his work in size and others. Um, and yet, you know, we, things go on as they were. And you think, you think, you think about, um, climate change and, and the ecological problems we're facing. Again, we know a lot about it now. You know, we've got very good information and yet things go on as they are. Um, and this is another area where opening it up is the first step, but beyond that, political action is needed. I think there comes a point where all the information uh, sort of sparks and something changes in, at the popular level. Uh, pe people, people are prepared to take action uh, to push things forward, to change things. And we just need to reach that point with, with education financing in the US and elsewhere. What happens in the US has enormous impact worldwide because it's because of the exemplary power of these institutions. Uh, and if there are opportunities for capital in the US, there are opportunities for capital elsewhere. So, um, so both the problem and the solution uh, are still going to be, I think, partly from the US. Um, we're greatly advantaged by having you on today, Charlie. We'd like you back. To talk about this and other issues in future we'll keep in touch i love with that and you know we will, we will buy your book and talk about your book thanks very much bye. thank you so bye. much
Bye to everyone. On Thursday, we have Mags Blackie talking about the human agency of scientists. That's also a very interesting presentation. Be, be with us in two days time to talk about, um, to talk about agency in science. Um, and meanwhile, thanks to you all for coming and thanks again to Charlie. Bye for now. Thank you very much, Charlie and Simon. Thank you, Simon. Thank you, Charlie.